Okay, so this lecture uh, is going to be on the concept okay, of what's called data assimilation. So this is an idea of taking a model and integrating it with data that you record from that system. Okay, so and there are techniques for doing this, and so part of what we're going to learn is thinking about what are called common filters and common ensemble filters, and that's what we want to lead up to in the third lecture where we do simulations, but right now we want to learn some of the fundamental principles behind how to think about data assimilation. So the concept is the following. I'm going to have a model, and I'm going to have measurements of a system, and I would like to capitalize on both of those to make predictions about the future state of a system. Okay, so let's write down my model. Here it is. Something like this. So, and y here generically is going to represent a vector. So the idea is the following, that I prescribe a model and uh, to solve this model, and for instance, y could be some vector in an n-dimensional space. And so I want to go ahead and solve this in order for me to uh, uniquely define some trajectory. I would also have to provide some initial condition for you. For instance, that. So what that allows me to do now is to say I want to go ahead, take my model with this initial data, and then simulate it forward into the future. Okay? So here's the problem. There's, a, there's an assumption that's being made here. And, uh, and the, the assumption is, is really important, is that you actually think, for you, uh, it, to get this trajectory right, you'd have to have a perfect model with a perfect measurement of that initial data, which, of course, is not the generic case. In fact, you never have that in practice. So you might have measurements of the system as well. So let me write down measurements of the system. So measurements might look something like this. So what I'm going to do is I have a function g, which are some potentially nonlinear measurement of the state y at different time points t. So I can prescribe all of this. And I might have, in fact, m measurements. So I would say, That's something that I want to consider. So this basically outlines the system we want to consider to do data simulation on. A model that I, I have, some initial data to run this model. So these two by themselves, this is an n-dimensional system for which if I prescribe these n constraints, I get a unique solution to propagate forward. But now, I'm also going to imply, apply some constraints g, which are measurements, m of them. So now this becomes an overdetermined system, right? So I have to satisfy this, and that's an n by n system. Applying this gives me now an additional m constraints, okay? All right, so, so we're, we're ultimately solving an overdetermined system in the da data simulation framework. And so we're going to have to think about how to, how to do that, okay? Now here's the issue. The issue is that this model, or in general the models that you may have, you may construct out of fairly complex systems, this is only an approximation to the true dynamics in that system. So you're probably missing some physics, and you may not be able to derive equations for those. So let's call the unmodeled physics Q1. So Q1, it will count for uh, anything that I didn't model, and we don't know it. That's the point, is that we don't actually know uh, how to build a model for, for we're not, what we're not able to observe. So we're just going to call it Q1. As far as the measurements go, the initial condition also will have some measurement error. Sorry, this is Q2. At time zero, I make a measurement error. So this is the reality of your situation. You have a model, it's not perfect, so there is some unmodeled physics there that you don't know. You have an initial condition, and you have some error associated with that measurement. Finally, you actually have 
a real measurement of the system. So this is, in some sense, model agnostic. It doesn't really care about what your model is. It's just going to say, let me measure this, the Y with some sensors. And so in some sense, you might think this is a fairly truthful representation. But the problem is, even your sensors have noise. So wherever you measured, it's going to generically have some kind of noise constraints on it. So your, 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 your measurement gonna, is going to create a, a problem there. OK, so this sets up the framework for the data simulation. A model with unknown physics, an initial condition that's only known to a certain level, and measurements that are actually, in fact, imperfect. So, and I don't necessarily know Q1, Q2, or Q3. So the question is, how am I going to go about solving this problem? So this is what the data simulation allows us to do which is what I'd really like to do is think about a trajectory of this system that somehow minimizes the model error, the initial condition error, and it also minimizes, in some sense, the measurement error. So in other words, my trajectory should, be, uh, should obey the sensors and somehow minimize whatever this error that, of the measurement that I have. Okay? So I want to find a that kind of trajectory that satisfies all these in some kind of optimal way. So this is going to mean that we're going to have to write down some objective function. Okay? So first, let me uh, remind everybody then, so Q1, this is going to be my model error. We're going to use this. Okay? We have Q2. This is your initial condition error. And then Q3 which is your measurement error. OK. So let's so erase this and start thinking about how we might go about solving this problem. So I said it's going to be an optimization. I'm going to try to find the best trajectories or the right solutions for this. And so this is going to be involve optimization. And we're going to figure out what kind of optimization do we want to set up. So there's a lot of different ways you can start identifying an objective function. An objective function is something you're going to try to minimize. And what's typically done is to define a quadratic optimization function. Okay? So the reason we do quadratics uh, of quadratic forms is because then we can apply convex optimization techniques to them. So let me write down one potential uh, quadratic form of an of a, of an optimization function or an objective function that we might want to consider. So j of y. So this is what we're going to construct and optimize over. So first of all, let me write this down. I'm going to solve this over some trajectory from time 0 to t, where I'm going to take my trajectory information. Let's call this t1, t2, dt1, dt2. So what this is, is a quadratic form for looking at the trajectory. So remember, q1 is the model error. So this q1 lives over the entire range from 0 to t. So this is the trajectory. And I'm going to say, look, I want to create what's look what basically here, where the w uh, here is inverse of the covariance, error covariance. So this is giving me my trajectory error. I also want to construct a quadratic form this is for the initial condition error and finally this is the measurement error so my goal is going to be to minimize this object which includes model error initial condition error trajectory error, all set up in quadratic forms, which allow me to very easily apply a convex optimization routine to find that solution. OK? Uh, in fact, uh, what we, it's also attractive to consider this, especially if you consider Gaussian statistics, because if you consider Gaussian statistics, and this is typically what we're going to assume is our error are some randomly, normally distributed uh, uh, noise processes, so, so some Gaussian statistics on it, then what we can find is that minimizing j, y here, our objective function, 
is equivalent to thinking of the probability density function in the following way, which is uh, so that essentially this is going to give us uh, that when I minimize this, it's equivalent to finding uh, a, mic a maximum likelihood estimator. Okay, so in other words, when you take the derivative of this thing, it's going to result basically in maximum likelihood estimates, okay, which is a standard thing to think about in statistics. Okay, so this is what our problem formulation is going to look like. We need to optimize this. I set quadratic forms, and if I can optimize over all these uh, errors, in st uh, errors in both trajectory, initial condition, and data measurements, then what I can find is the best data assimilated trajectory possible. Okay? If the model was perfect, then this would drop out, this first term. If the initial condition measurements were perfect, this would drop out. If the measurement device I had was perfect, then this thing here would also drop out. Okay? So we can start thinking about um, looking at individual pieces or as a whole. So I want to work through an example of this to make it more concrete. And this example, I think, illustrates all of the key uh, architectures around data simulation and is actually very simple and intuitive to understand. More than that, we can actually compute in closed form our data assimilated solution. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and remove these for now. And we're going to start thinking about framing this model. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to think about a measurement, x. This is my model. So x will represent my model variable. And for now, let's just assume that x has a probability distribution. So I've come up with a model, which is, let's say, uh, a probabilistic model for predicting x. And let's say that this thing here then has probability distribution function p of x. Okay? That's my model. That was my dy dt equals f. For right now, I'm going to assume it's a probabilistic model. I'm also going to assume I have a measurement y. And this has some probability uh, distribution function p of y. Okay? So I take my measurement, and so the measurement itself is, uh, has error, and so that error is defined by this p of y, and the model itself is a model which has a distribution p of x. Okay? So here's my objective in data simulation. I have a model that's going to predict the future state for me. I have some measurements. The question is, how do the measurements inform my model prediction? Okay? So another way to think about that is writing down Bayes' rule here. It helps frame what we want to do. So the Bayes' formula is the following. I want the following. P of x given y. What's the probability? In other words, what's my What's the value of x given that it took a measurement y? Okay? So what I have is p of x, p of y. What I'd like to compute is this conditional probability statement, which just says, I want to know the state of my system given that I just took a measurement with a value of y. Okay? Now what Bayes' rules allows us to pr uh, produce is the following. We can write this instead, p y of x times px, py. Now, the py on the bottom is just going to be a normalization factor, so we're not going to really worry about that, but we're going to focus on, on these two terms here. So what do they mean? So py with conditional x. So this is easier for us to compute. It says, what's the probability of this measurement given that my model produced x? Okay, so we can obviously compute the model and now we can say, so, so what's the probability of this given that my model produced x? We can actually compute that. Okay? We can also compute, we actually have the model itself. Okay? So these are two things that we 
can actually compute in order for us to come back and say, I want now the model result given that the measurement was y. So that's the basic framework and architecture we want to consider. So what we're going to do with this, and in fact, uh, what a lot of people do with this typically assume some kind of uh, Gaussian distribution of the variables, and we're going to do that here, and it's actually in the second lecture of, of this series. Um, we're going to go ahead and assume that as well, and it has some nice uh, implications in terms of making a vector formulation of this, where oftentimes what you do to reduce things and make them nice is you assume Gaussian statistics. We'll do the same thing here. Okay, so that's what we have here. And we want to move forward then now with this problem. And so if I assume Gaussian statistics, then from this Bayes formula, I'm going to assume that in fact the following exists. So P, Y, given X, is equal to some constant E to the minus 1 half Y minus X sigma, sigma Y uh, squared. So some Gaussian distribution. The constant C1, who cares? This is just that uh, this thing here will have a uh, area in the curve will be 1. So it would define a probability distant, uh, distribution. But all I care about right now is what's up, what's up top in that Gaussian, which is now it's the difference between y, my measurement, and x, my model. Sigma y is the variance associated with y. Right? So this is the variance of my measurement. So if, my, if, my, if I know something about my sensors, it will give me a distribution, uh, uh, error distribution of my, my sensor or measurement itself, and that's what's here. That's that variance. I also take my model to be just some Gaussian distribution. So e to the minus 1 half. Here it's sigma naught squared. So this has a mean x naught, a variance sigma naught. Okay, I'm going to try to switch pins here, make it a little quieter. We'll see if that works. Okay, so this is what I'm going to assume. Two Gaussians. One with mean zero, x naught, sigma naught. That's my model that I have. And then my uh, measurement given x will also be Gaussian distributed. Let's assume that. And so this will give me some variance. Uh, around the difference between the measurement and the model prediction. Okay, so this forms the basic structure we want to do, and now we can start to calculate this PXY. So the PXY is just PY of X, Y given X, and PX, which is the multiplication of these two functions together. Okay, so that's pretty simple to compute, right? So it's P x, y. It's now some new constant. Let's call it c3. And now you get these two exponents put together here, minus 1 half, y minus x, sigma y squared times e to the minus 1 half, x minus x naught, sigma naught squared. Okay? So that's uh, P of x, y now with some scaling factors. So now I have this Bayes rule worked out for this very simple case of two Gaussian, of, of, of Gaussian distributions of the, of the, of the noise and the, and the variance. Okay? So uh, this is a nice formula in a sense that I have this very simple calculation that I performed using Bayes rule. And now I have an estimation of what is the value, what's the probability of, give, of a value x given my measurement y, which is exactly what I want to compute. Okay, and I would like to find the maximum likelihood of that value. So what we're going to do is compute the maximum likelihood estimate and compute what those values are. So in fact, we're not going to compute directly p of xy. We're going to compute, or even the likelihood, we're going to compute the log likelihood. And the reason we compute the log likelihood should be obvious here because you have exponentials. And if I take the log of exponentials, log of exponentials just drop down these guys, which gives me simple quadratics. So that's why we assume Gaussian statistics often. And then you take the log of it, and then everything comes down to simple uh, quadratic functions. 
So let me write that down. So we're going to look at li log likelihood here, which is, let's call it j of x. And now this j of x, negative log, and I'm going to compute p of x y, given y, plus log c3. And the only reason I put log c3 here is it, it basically removes the c3 here. Okay, so if I put this in here and I take the log, the log of this product of C3 times this becomes the log of C3 plus the log of this. The log of C3 cancels out with here because of the negative sign. And so this whole thing here, once I take the log, is just simply a quadratic form, which is y minus x, sigma y squared, plus x minus x naught, sigma naught squared. So that's what that comes out to be. It's a very simple form. And again, these simple forms, this is why people look at log likelihoods. Log likelihoods go amazingly well with Gaussian statistics because you get simple formulas like this. Okay, so that's a very common th thing you see in people. If you don't have anything better to assume about the noise statistics, you assume Gaussian statistics. And then if you take a log likelihood, these things come down to simple forms, such as this. Okay? My objective is to find the x that minimizes this. And that's very simple to do by simply computing the derivative with respect to x, setting it to zero. There is no maximum error you could make but there's a minimum error you could make. And so we're going to try to find that minimum error. So wherever I find this to be true, that's the point I'm looking for. And of course, it's a quadratic form. So finding the minimum of that is fairly simple. And let me write it down for you. And then this has all the information we need concerning our estimation or of our assimilated solution. So when I take the derivative of this, uh, it's going to give me some x value. Let's call it x bar. And x bar, if I do the derivative, is sigma y squared over sigma y squared plus sigma naught squared x naught plus sigma naught squared over sigma y squared plus sigma naught squared times y. So this is the prediction for the value of x, my data simulated value. Without the measurement, what would happen? If I had no measurement data, okay, then, uh, then what would happen? Well, so in that case, if there's no measurement data, what I would actually get is x naught, okay? So, uh, so one of the ways to see that is uh, just simply start thinking about taking sigma y to be zero, Oh, so, okay, actually, let's, let's do two, two cases. Let's take the case where my measurement is perfect. So when I take this measurement, there is no noise. My sensor is a perfect sensor. If I have a perfect sensor, what that means, sigma y is zero. If sigma y is zero, notice what happens. This drops out. You get sigma y is 0. You get sigma naught squared over sigma naught squared. It becomes 1. And then x bar is y. In other words, the data simulation says if you have a perfect measurement, it is exactly what the state of the system is. So at least it's a consistency check, right? This tells you that, oh, the model at least does what it should do when I have a perfect measurement. Remember, it's trying to balance model accuracy and measurement accuracy. But if the measurement is perfect, it will weight everything to that measurement because it is, in fact, the actual state of the system. Okay? So that's a nice little uh, result from that. Okay? So that's your data simulated solution. The other thing I want to write down for you here, and I'll write it, uh, actually, I'll write it below here. I'm, so that's the perfect sensor case. The other thing I can compute is the variance 
of my measurement, of my simulated solution. So I'm going to call that sigma bar squared. And I want you to notice the following. So here's, the, here's what this form could be. It can either be this. I can write it like this. Or, alternatively, I can write it like this. Okay? Oop, so it's sigma y here, sigma 0 there. So I can write it in one of these two ways. And the thing that I want to point out about writing it in these two ways is that these are less than either sigma naught squared or sigma not y squared. So let's take a look at the first one. I have sigma naught over, uh, sorry, these should be squareds up here. There, okay. So I have 1 plus some positive number. So this is bigger than 1. If that's bigger than 1, then this thing here is smaller than sigma naught squared. So what it's telling you then is your variance of the simulated solution has a smaller variance than if you just used the measurement, or so the model alone. This one tells you that if this is on the bottom, 1 plus something bigger than 1, so it's smaller than sigma y squared, the variance is also smaller than the measurement alone. So the data assimilated solution is better than either the measurement or the model alone. And so it gives you this beautiful result, which is saying, hey, I can reduce my error or reduce my variance in my data assimilated solution. And there is, in fact, a closed form solution telling you how your variance is reduced in this assimilated solution x bar. Okay. I want to draw a picture of this, just so we have an understanding of how this is actually working. So here's the picture uh, of the simulated solution. So let me, I have a better picture in the notes, but here's what it is. I have some probability distribution. Let's call this p of x. So this is my model. It's a Gaussian distribution from what I assumed here, but if I picked some dynamical model, well, it had some distribution. And I could say, well, and then here is my measurement given x. So here, this is the distribution saying, what is the value? So, uh, so what p of y of x is, right, is uh, what's the probability of y given my model x? So I have a model. And then I can compute, well, if, if I have this model, what's the probability that I got a score like this y? So this is, in some sense, what sensors are telling me. This is what my model is telling me. And you can see they're different. And what data simulation does is it basically says, well, here's where I think the solution lives. Here's where I think the solution lives. And here is where they both at least agree. <laughs> and so essentially it creates that, which is your p, y, x, p of x. And that's my x bar. So now what it says is here's my, my randomness here, my randomness here. Now it creates a pinch point, which is basically this is the place where it makes sense with both the model and the measurement error. Both things have a certain amount of error. And I pick the one in which it minimizes essentially the error I'm making overall. So that's your data assimilated distrib distribution. And it gives you a much tighter variance, as you can see, and it gives you a better prediction of what the assimilated solution should look like. So that's a graphical representation uh, of this process in general here, which you can work out completely. Let me also highlight a more general framing of this which is another way to express this result here, is by saying, OK, so my job is to make a prediction given a model in the data. And so the assimilated solution, x bar, is equal to my model prediction, x naught, plus k, y minus x naught. This is the generic framework for data simulation. k here is equal to sigma naught squared, sigma naught squared plus sigma y squared. 
So what it has is the variance of your model divided by the variance of the model plus the variance of the measurement. And this thing here is less than 1 or equal to 1. This here, that term, this is called the innovation. So in the data assimilation literature, the innovation is the correction to your model due to the measurement. So without any measurement, this thing is zero. Okay? So that's zero, and so all I get is x naught is my prediction that comes from the model. Once I include the model, okay, then if I include that, or sorry, once I include a measurement, it's going to now update my prediction. So I take my model and I basically do something like this. I say, yeah, but uh, my measurement device has some error that I have, and I want to make sure that I pick a solution that's within my bounds of error of that sensor because the sensor has a certain distribution. And so this weights your prediction in, in this way. So this is called the innovation. Uh, and in fact, uh, K itself is called the Kalman filter, okay, or the Kalman gain. And Kalman filtering, uh, or this Kalman idea in a data simulation, is, is incredibly important for a lot of problems. This becomes what we're going to talk about in the third lecture and even tomorrow on ensemble Kalman filtering. This is what's allowing people to do the best weather predictions and forecasts in the world today. This is a forecasting tool. I have a model that's imperfect, but I have a lot of measurements to help inform the model, to work with the model to get a best prediction. Ensemble common filtering is set up like this in order for us to make uh, better predictions for the future state of complex systems where I know my model is incapable of capturing all the physics. And so this is the basic structure. What we're going to do in the second lecture is we're going to basically take this and make it into a vector form. And then finally, in the third lecture, we'll actually do some example simulations of this system. But remember this. This is the key result, which is I have a data simulated solution, which is a linear combination of my model prediction and a weighting with my measurement. Okay.